Thanks, dads, for being every day real life superheroes. It's the small things that we do. I'm already preaching. You guys aren't with me. Is this how it's going to be? I said it's the small things that we do every single day that make the biggest impact on our children. We're in a series right now called Story Time. We're looking at the stories that Jesus told. These are parables, stories that Jesus told to help people understand spiritual principles. And today we're going to talk about dads, and we're going to talk about fathers. I have a dad who always went the extra mile. He worked hard to provide for our family. He, he traveled he would travel long distances to watch me play basketball. And what was amazing is that I wasn't even the best player on a bad team. But I can count on one hand how many times I ever put a jersey on that my dad was not either my coach or that he was not in the stands watching and supporting. He always went the extra mile, not just for me, but for others. He's devoted his life to ministry and pouring himself into other people. I know that I am extremely blessed to have had the example that I had as a father. I know that not everyone is so blessed. In fact, we live in a society where we are just begging dads to take on their basic responsibilities. And as a culture, the dads who go an extra mile, the dads who are over the top, the dads who are extravagant are uncommon. I believe that as followers of Jesus, though, that is exactly who we have been called to be. We're called to give our all. We're called to lay it all on the line for our children and for our families because our Heavenly Father laid it all on the line for us. So many people have a hard time understanding the love of a heavenly father because they didn't experience anything that resembled love from their earthly fathers. Men, we are called to be counter-cultural in the way that we love and care for our children and our families. We're called to extravagant, over-the-top love. Today, we're going to look at the story of the prodigal son to see what the Bible says about the role of a godly Father. In fact, to help us really focus in on the father in the story, I want to relabel the story this morning. We call this story most often the prodigal son. And if we're not careful, we can use the word prodigal to always mean something negative. We can use the word prodigal as a replacement for wayward or astray. He was the prodigal son who returned, but that's actually not worth what the word prodigal means. The word prodigal means recklessly extravagant, having spent everything, still giving even more, giving your all. And while this does describe the son in a negative way, I believe that it also very much describes the father in a positive way. He was over the top. He was extravagant. Having given everything that he should have given, he turned around and gave even more. So I want to title our talk today, story time, the prodigal father, the prodigal father. If you spend a lot of time in or around a church, or probably even if you haven't, there's a good chance that you have heard this story that we're going to talk about this morning. It's one of the most popular parables, it's one of the most popular stories that Jesus ever told in his life here on earth. But if we just pluck this one story out of Scripture, and we read it as a standalone story, we miss so much about what Jesus is trying to tell us. This story is actually the third of three back-to-back-to-back stories that Jesus told the same people at the exact same time. So today, we're going to look at all three of the stories, and we're going to see how the stories fit together. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 15, Luke 15. We're going to begin in verse number 1. Luke 15, in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. Him is Jesus. The tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, 
saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Let's take a break. We're going to stop as we go through the text this morning. Let's take our first break here. This isn't necessarily what we're going to talk about today, but I can't read this text without noting it. Sinners are drawn to Jesus. Sinners are drawn to Jesus. Sinners should be drawn to the Jesus who is inside of you. Sinners should be drawn to our church. Why? Because if you give hopeless people hope, they'll turn out. If you give depressed people joy, they will come. If you give broken people restoration, then they'll show up. If you give lost people a way back home, then they will be attracted to that. Jesus did not establish the church as a social club for the spiritually elite. He, had cre he created the church to be an emergency room triage for people who were sick and lost and dying and going to hell. Y'all are going to get with me or you're not, but I'm going to go ahead and preach if it's okay with everybody this morning. I know it's Father's Day. I know it's a holiday, so everybody's like, I got the roast on. I got to get home. We're going to celebrate dads, and we're going to do all that stuff. But if it's okay for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to go ahead and preach. I said, this place should not be a social club where we all gather on Sundays and pat each other on the back for being really good people. It should be a place where people come in, and they're on the verge of dying and going to hell without Jesus and we can give them the life support that they need in him. In the triage unit, they don't even worry about cleaning up after the person that they just saved before the next person comes in. Cleaning them up is not the priority. I walked by a triage unit in a hospital several months ago and there was still blood on the floor that they were wheeling in new patients on top of. It is not our job to make sure that people are nice and clean before we bring them into the church. Our job is to give them the life that they need in Jesus and let him take care of everything else. Sinners will be drawn to Jesus. Jesus just shut, he just sat down and they showed up around him. Tax collectors, thieves, and other sinners. But as we see in the story, I'm going to try my best not to meddle this morning. As we see in the story, it's not the thieves and the thugs and the sinners who are giving Jesus a problem. It's the church people. Who was grumbling? The Pharisees, the scribes, the religious elite people. They were the ones who were grumbling the ones who should have supported Jesus ministry the most the one who sh who should have been standing by him and welcoming home these lost people the ones who should have supported him the most are the ones who were giving him the most problems and so that he tells this story to them these stories are told directly to the religious people Jesus was trying to get them to understand the love that God the Father has for lost people. And in doing so, I believe that he gives us the prescription for what it looks like to be a prodigal father, an extravagant, over-the-top, will give everything kind of father. Let's pick it up in verse number four. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman... Having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin 
that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So Jesus lays the foundation for his final story in the trilogy, the one that we're going to look at this morning. And we know this story is the prodigal son. But remember, we're looking at what makes a prodigal father, over-the-top, extravagant, loving, giving father. Instead of reading this entire story, because it's quite lengthy, instead of reading the entire story, I want to set up the background of the story for you, and then we're going to move down to verse number 17. There's a father, and the man has two sons. The youngest son rebels against his father and rebels against the family. He asks for his share of the estate. Basically, he goes to his dad, and he says, Dad, I wish that you were dead so I could have the money that's due to me. You got a lot of money, Dad, and I would rather have that money than have you. So can you just go ahead and give me what's mine? Can you go ahead and give me what I've got coming to me, and I'll leave just as if you were dead? He shames his father. He shames his family. He leaves home. He squanders his money. He ends up working in a far-off land, feeding pigs. The younger son made a mess, decided eventually that he was going to go home. And I want to spend the majority of our time that we have together this morning looking at how the father reacts to disappointment. You can tell a lot about a person about how they react to disappointment. Everybody can be good when it's all good. Everybody can be positive and upbeat whenever everything is going good. But you can tell something about what's inside someone, who's inside someone, based on how they react to disappointment. And I think we see something, some things in the father and the way that he reacts to being disappointed, let down by his son, that we can all take home today. Verse number 17. But when he came to himself, this is the son, but when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. It's my favorite line in the whole story. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Before he could get clean, his father saw him. Before he could deliver this beautiful speech that he had come up with, the father saw him. Before he could repent, before he could clean his life up, the mess that he was in, before he could do any of that stuff, when he was still a long way off, the father saw him. We're going to pause there and talk about this. Number one, a prodigal father never gives up on his children. A prodigal father, an extravagant father, an over-the-top father, never gives up on his children. We don't know exactly how long the son had been gone. The Bible doesn't say expressly how long he was gone, but we do have enough information in the text to know that this whole thing didn't just happen overnight. He went to a faraway land. He set up a life there. He spent all of his money there. He went and got a job there. He did that for a little bit and then realized, I got to go back home. This is crazy. And then he journeyed all the way back home. So I don't know how long it took. Maybe it was months. Maybe it was years, but this was over a prolonged period of time. But even after all this time, Jesus paints the picture of a father who is still looking in a way that when the son returned, he could see him a long way off. He could see him a long way off. How could he see him from so far away? Because he was looking for him every day. Just like in our first two stories, the shepherd and the woman did not give up on finding what was lost. The shepherd left the 99 and he searched until he found 
the lost sheep. The woman lost the coin. She lit her lamp and she searched until she found the lost coin. They weren't going to give up. How many opportunities did this father have to quit? How many opportunities did he have to give up? How many times did his neighbors look at him sitting on the front porch and laugh and say, he's sitting out there again waiting. When's he going to realize this is never going to happen? When's he going to realize that boy's never coming back? Doesn't he remember what that boy said to him before he left? Doesn't he remember the shame that that son brought on his family? Doesn't he remember whenever he went into the marketplace for the next year that people looked at him with pity because he was the man who raised the son who wished that he was dead? Doesn't he remember all of that stuff, but still he comes out day after day after day? Don't you think that the dad had some opportunities to say, you know what, that's it. I waited long enough. I, I, I was more than fair. Yes, absolutely. Don't you think that there were days when he woke up and he didn't want to go out and wait on his son to return? Don't you think that there were days when he got up and he was reminded, you did this yesterday, you did it the day before, you did it the day before. How long are you going to wait? But we learn from this story that a prodigal father never gives up on his children. I've got a word for some fathers in the room today who are looking for a son or a daughter to come back home. Never give up. Never give up. Here's the thing, dads. Anybody can give up. Any average dad can give up. Anybody can walk away, but we have been called to more. We have been called to be prodigal, extravagant, all-in, over-the-top fathers as followers of Jesus Christ. And that means that we can never give up. We never give up. And I don't just mean that they're physically going to return. I mean that they are spiritually going to return. Just like we should be dads who never give up on our kids, our Heavenly Father will never give up on us his capacity for hope so much greater than what we can understand his capacity for grace is so much bigger than what we can understand and he will always be there when you turn when you show the first sign of repentance and turning when you turn back to god he will always be standing there waiting on you we have a father who never gives up on us so we should not give up on our kids on our marriage on our spouse we should not give up on other people i've told you guys this before but i tell my sons often when i'm putting them to bed son no matter where you go and no matter what you do in life you can always come home why because i need them to understand that i will never give up on them i it's not just something that i want I need them to know the love of a father because the very first representation of a father that they will ever understand is me. I need them to know that I'll accept them back so that when they fail one day, so that when they fall spiritually one day, they understand that they have a heavenly father and just like dad will take me back, my heavenly father will take me back. I, I am far from a perfect parent. I'll tell you some stories this morning before it's all over about some parenting fails that I have had, and I completely understand that. But one thing that we do get right is we make sure that our sons know, I'll never give up on you. A prodigal father never gives up on his children. Let's continue reading in verse number 20. And he rose and came to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Number two, a prodigal father has compassion for his children. A prodigal father has compassion for his children. This one is definitely counter-cultural. We live in a culture where the compassion is mostly taken care of by the moms. 
right? Moms are really great at compassion. Dads, we're really great at the discipline side most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, mom handles the compassion and dad handles the the discipline and the correction. But we have been called as followers of Jesus, as prodigal fathers, to be compassionate with our children. Again, anybody can be cold-hearted and unforgiving. It doesn't take any effort. It doesn't take any intentionality to do that. But we have been called to more. We have been called to more. I've been the father of two boys for three and a half weeks now. And if I'm just being honest, I'm barely treading water. I don't know if they're picking it up on the live stream, but I'm sure that the people on the front rows can tell that I got some bags underneath my eyes. We're just making it. One thing that I did find out very quickly, though, was when we added Brantley to the mix, everything changed. It was all different whenever we brought, when we brought baby boy number two home. And we've been living in really a state of consistent exhaustion. And because of that, over the last few weeks, I know that I have had some parenting fails with both Brantley and Judah, but especially with Judah. You know Judah, he's just about enough to handle on his own. He's just about boy enough that he can take two people. You add another one to the mix and he becomes even more demanding. The other day he was jumping around as he so loves to do. He was jumping around from chair to chair in the dining room and I was in the kitchen and I said, son, stop doing that. Does he stop? Nah. Jumps again. Judah, you better stop. Does he stop? Nope. Jumps again. But this time, bang, crash, right on the floor. Immediately, the tears start falling. And in my frustration, the first thing that happened was not that I ran over to my child to check on his wounds, to see if he was okay. I said, Son, if you had listened to me just a second ago, you wouldn't be laying on the floor crying right now. Not my most compassionate moment. Not not my best moment as a dad. And of course, that's just a minor thing, but the way that we react to minor everyday things often determines how we react to major life-changing things. I just started preaching again, so go ahead and get back with me. The routine that we set up of reacting to things, even when they're small things that seemingly don't even matter, if we do the certain a certain thing over and over and over and over again, when something big happens, we will naturally respond in the same way. And while there is a time for lessons, I think that we dads have been called to lead with compassion, to lead with love, to make our first step a compassionate one. Prodigal fathers lead with undignified love, undignified love. The story depicts a father who ran to his son. And if you understand the culture of the day, to run, the father would have had to take the robe that he was wearing and pull it up and expose his leg so he didn't trip when he was running. And that was an undignified thing for a man to do. But after all, this dad didn't care what other, all the other dads in the neighborhood thought because they told him he should have given up on this kid a long time ago. And so a prodigal father will be undignified in the way that they go after, in the way that they reach, in the way that they love their children. He kissed him. He embraced him. He welcomed him back, and he did it all without telling him what he had done wrong. He did all of it. He ran to him, fell on him. This guy had been sleeping with pigs, y'all. He was nasty. He was dirty. He was filthy. 
He had journeyed a long way. The dad fell on him and kissed him on the neck before he cleaned him up, before he gave him a lesson, before he said, now, son, you know what you did was wrong. Why? Because a prodigal father leaves with compassion. A prodigal father leaves with love. In my experience, when the son returns, they don't need to be told everything that they have done wrong. They know what they did. That's why they came back. Again, is there a time for correction? Is there a time for coaching? Yes, absolutely, there's a time for that. But it's not in that moment of return. That is when we should lead with compassion. Lead with compassion. This is exactly what we get from God our Father and all of our mess, through all of our sin, with the way that we shamed ourselves and we shamed Him. His compassion and love for us is simply amazing. He always leaves with compassion. We don't have to clean up. We don't have to wash the stench off of our body before He'll love us. All we have to do is show a sign of turning and He'll be there to accept us as we are. Prodigal fathers have uncommon compassion for their children. Let's pick up in verse number 21. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. I love how the father did not even address what the son said. The son comes back with his grand speech that he had thought about on the whole journey back. The father completely ignores it. In fact, he interrupts him and doesn't even let him finish giving this grand speech that he came up with. He completely ignores it, and he goes about setting in motion the restoration of the son. What he gives the son in restoration is important. He gives him a robe. A robe. Imagine what has happened. This guy's dirty. His clothes torn. He didn't have any money to buy new clothes he had just journeyed a long way and so the father takes a new robe and what does he do he drapes it over all the mess y'all aren't listening to me this morning he took a robe and he covered up all of the junk I'm so thankful that we have a heavenly father who will take a robe of righteousness and when I'm dirty and nasty and don't deserve it and I never could have found my way back on my own, I never could have got clean on my own, he'll take that robe of righteousness and he'll cover me with his forgiveness and his love and his blood. I'm so thankful that I've been given a robe that I did not deserve. He put a ring on his hand. The ring signifies that he's been restored to the family. Slaves didn't get rings. Only sons got rings. He would have been happy coming back and working for dad, working to earn his keep, but that wasn't part of dad's plan. He went about restoring him to his original position in the family. I'm so thankful for a God who put a ring on my hand. I'm so thankful for a God who restored me to sonship. I'm so thankful for a God who will restore you as a son and as a daughter, even when we don't deserve it. What else did he do? He gave him new shoes. I like shoes. He gave him some new... Monty, he gave him some new shoes. He gave him new shoes. What does he say with that? Hey, the places where you've been, the journey that you've taken, that's in the past. This is a new season. This is a new journey. I'm so thankful for God who will give me new shoes, who will give me a chance at a new season, even when I messed the last one up, even when I don't deserve a new season because of how I really botched the last season that he set me up for. He'll still give me a new season. He'll give me new shoes to put on my feet. What did he do? He restored his son. He affirmed his son's position in the family. There's something 
about the words of affirmation that come from a father. There are very few people in this world whose words mean as much to me as dad's words. There's just something about it. Dads, our words are powerful. Our words have an impact on our children. So let's use those words to affirm. Dads, let's use our words to restore. Let's use our words to encourage. I'm thankful for dads who restore children after they make mistakes, and I'm thankful for a heavenly father who will restore me whenever I make mistakes. A prodigal father will restore his children when they fail. Verse number 23. This is still the father speaking as he ignores his son. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. Let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Number four, a prodigal father celebrates with his children. A prodigal father, an extravagant father, an all-in dad, will celebrate with his children. At the each each of these stories, as they ended, they ended with a celebration. Whenever the shepherd found the sheep, when he got back home, he called all of his friends, and he said, hey, let's throw a party because I found the sheep. When the woman found the coin, she called all of her neighbors and all of her friends and said, hey, I'm rejoicing because I found this coin. Let's have a celebration because I found the coin. And we see the same thing in this story. The dad says, hey, kill the fattened calf. We're going to throw the biggest party around and celebrate because my son was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he is found so interesting to me that the cost of the party would have been more than one sheep. The cost of the party would have been more than one coin. The son had already cost the dad. It was costing him even more. He killed the fattened calf. He killed a valuable one through a big party. The cost for our salvation was more. More than we could ever more than we could ever imagine when the perfect lamb of God was slain for our sins there's a celebration a prodigal father celebrates with their children we talked about this a couple weeks ago when we talked about awesome families we said awesome families have fun together dads this should start with us have fun with your family. Have fun with your kids. When they succeed, when they do the right thing, when they have success, we should celebrate them. We should celebrate with them. Dads, we're pretty good about making a lesson out of everything. We can turn anything into a teachable moment. But sometimes a success just needs to be a success. That's it. No lesson, no teaching. No coaching. We won by one point, but we still won. And so we're going to celebrate. Sometimes a success just needs to be a success. Celebrate with your kids and your family. Why? Because what gets celebrated will be repeated. What gets celebrated will be repeated. Is there a place for correction? Yes. But the power of celebration is greater, is stronger than the power of coaching and the power of correction every day. You can celebrate one time, and your kid will be like, oh, that was pretty cool. That's way better than getting in trouble. I'm going to try that again. What we celebrate gets repeated. Let your kids hear you say, I love you. Let your kids hear you say, I'm proud of you. Let them hear you say it. Look for opportunities. Look for excuses to tell your children 
I love you. I'm proud of you. Affirm them with your words. Affirm them with your words. Likewise, we have a heavenly Father who throws a party in heaven every time one sinner returns. Every time one person turns back to Jesus, there's a celebration, there's a party that happens in heaven. A prodigal father celebrates with his children. I'm getting ready to close, but I have to tell you how the story ends. The older brother comes back home to find the party going on. The older brother here represents the religious elite, the religious leaders who Jesus is talking to. And the older brother is angry that the father accepted the younger brother back in and then celebrated and threw him a party. And the story ultimately ends open-ended. We don't know ultimately how the older brother responds. Jesus is trying to get these religious leaders to answer the question, would they accept the younger brother? Would they accept the wayward brother, the sinful brother, back into the family? Would the older brother love him again? Would he sacrifice for his younger brother? See, this was going to cost the older brother something. The younger brother left. He took a third of the inheritance. The older brother got double what the younger brother got in those times. And so he would have taken a third of the inheritance. Well, he took his third, and he completely wasted it. Squandered, gone. When the dad put that ring back on the younger brother's hand, he said, you're a son again with full rights. You're a complete heir again. And so this cost the older brother something. Because now what the older brother had everything that remained, well, now he only had two-thirds of what remained because the younger brother was reinstated. It's going to cost us something if we're going to bring in the younger brother. Church, it's going to cost us something if we're going to welcome in the lost younger brother? Would the older brother accept the grace and the love that was extended to the younger brother as had been extended to him? Jesus wants the religious people to answer this question, and I think that they're good questions for us to reflect on this morning. What will we, as a church, do? Will we sit in our comfort and judge as the religious elite who have now earned our position in the family or will we be people who don't believe in a lost cause will we be people who never give up will we be people who restore will we be people who lead with compassion will we be people who celebrate when people who are lost become found when people who are dead become alive it's story time Today I want to tell you a story that I heard from my friend Jesus. Once upon a time, I was lost, but God never gave up on me. And he was compassionate toward me. And he restored me back to my rightful position in the family, and he celebrated.